Amos chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roars, roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. All right, here we go. This is going to be a fun Bible study. Let's get some background information. Let me develop some things with you, and I don't think that the study tonight is going to take that long. It's really an introductory study and all, but let me give you some information related to this book and concerning Amos. And so for those of you who take notes, um, Amos prophesied, as mentioned, during the reign of Uzziah and the reign of Jeroboam. Now, Uzziah is the king of Judah, Jeroboam the second is who he's referring to, was the king of Israel. And so Bible commentators will date his book somewhere between 760 to 753 B.C. We see that Amos was a herdsman. He was also a farmer. And he was called to be a prophet to the nation. That's what it says in verse 1 when it says, The words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekwa, when he saw concerning which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. He was called by the Lord as a prophet. Now, it's interesting to note that he refers to himself as a herdsman. He was a shepherd, is what he was. And later on, he'll refer to himself, and I'll show you this in just a moment. He'll, he'll refer to himself as a farmer. And this is a man who was a herdsman and a farmer who's called by God to be a prophet to the nation. Now, when it speaks concerning Amos as a prophet, he does refer to himself in a certain way. It's interesting how the Lord used various men and women in the Old Testament to prophesy, to speak forth his word. Prophesy speaks, forth, uh, speaks of speaking forth the word of God, speaking forth also as foretelling. So there are a couple of aspects of prophecy or a prophet. A prophet could be speaking forth the mind of God for that moment, but a prophet also, and you'll see this in the book of Amos, is speaking concerning the mind of God for the future. There are times that he will foretell, meaning he'll speak concerning what God is concerned about right now, and he'll declare the mind of God, and then there are other times when the prophet will give information related to things that will take place in the still distant future. And when you look at the various prophets, and I didn't want to do this because it would take too much time, but when you look at the various ones who were prophetic in the Old Testament, you'll see that there are kings who were prophets, kings like David and kings like Solomon. There were rich men who were prophetic, men like Abraham. There were priests who also were prophets, men like, like Samuel. So it's interesting to note that God is speaking through a man who's referring to himself as a, a herdsman and as a farmer. And so this call, this call to prophesy to the nation, well, it comes from God. It doesn't come from somebody's extreme qualification. Like I said, there are kings and, and there are priests um, rich men, etc., who are used by the Lord to prophesy. But he begins by letting us know that, that he's nothing. He was a nothing in the sight of others. He was simply a herdsman. He was a shepherd, and he was simply a farmer. Now, he was from a small village. He refers to it as Tekwa. The, the word Tekwa speaks of a stockade. And if you were looking at a map of Israel and you saw the city of Jerusalem, well, Tekwa would be a, a, a small city that was 12 miles south of the city of Jerusalem. And it's near the city that's also referred to in Scripture, quite often named Hebron. Now, as mentioned a moment ago, his humble origins didn't oppress the people of his day. You can see that, you can actually fast forward that to even today, and you can see that, that people who have humble origins very often aren't looked at or regarded very highly by, by many people. 
they, they very often will think that if you're going to be somebody that is used in a mighty way, that you really ought to have more of a noble birth and a noble pedigree. Uh, but God has had, always had a way of using the off-scouring, using those that were not esteemed highly. He has always had a way of using them because Paul would tell us in 1 Corinthians uh, because when he uses people like that who are not noble and mighty and all of that, he says that's because people like that don't steal glory from God because God gets all the glory because people will look and say, how is it that this person is being used in such a magnificent capacity? And then they have to say within themselves, it's got to be God because there's certainly no quality that that person has on their own. So his humble origins didn't impress the people of his day. When you look at this, and we're going to be seeing this later on in chapter 7, there's a, a priest, and his name is Amaziah. And this priest named Amaziah brings an accusation against him. Amaziah accuses Amos of conspiring against the king and is causing, he says, you're causing the nation of Israel to become discouraged. You see, Amos had told the people of the northern kingdom that they were going to go into captivity. And so, so this uh, this priest Amaziah is very upset and actually brings an accusation against, uh, against him to the king. You see, at that time, when you look in the Bible, you'll discover this. At that time, the nation of Israel was actually divided into two kingdoms. Divided into what is called the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And when that division occurred during the time of uh, Rehoboam, son of Solomon, when that kingdom division occurred through a rebellion by a man named Jeroboam. Jeroboam went to the north and he took 10 of the tribes with him and they became what is called the 10 northern tribes. And so Jeroboam divided the nation of Israel, which was made up of 12 tribes, into the 10 northern tribes and the two southern tribes. Now, in order to keep the people from the north from going to the temple, which was in the south, in the city of Jerusalem, he set up alternative worship sites. So you have at the northern portion of the nation of Israel, in a region that is called Dan, you had a, an altar that was built by Jeroboam. We've been to this altar 20, 20 sometimes, 23, 24 times. It's up in the north. But there was a second altar. It was in a place called Bethel. If you were looking at a map, Bethel would have been at the southernmost border that was separating northern Israel from Judah, Israel from Judah. So Amaziah is a priest in Bethel. He's a priest over this alternative site to worship. And Amos, you'll see this when we get to chapter 7, Amos has been prophesying that the Assyrians are going to come and take the nation into captivity, that the ten northern tribes are going to be taken into captivity. Amaziah is typical of many people, even to this day, who gets upset to hear a negative report. And so he's upset, and he's saying, you're discouraging the people. You're saying that people are going to be taken into captivity. And he brings this report to the king, and he tells the king that this man, Amos, is discouraging the people by saying they're going to go into captivity. And so they're very upset. Now, that tells me that when he's speaking to um, Amos, it gives me some insight into Amos as being what would be called a prophet to the north, or is also referred to theologically as a northern prophet, because he's speaking to the people in the north at that time. And so he's a northern prophet. And so this man, Amaziah's response, is typical of people who are convicted of sin. And so he says this message that you're bringing is not welcome in Israel, when you read Amos chapter 7, verse 12, and we'll get there in about six months. Now, when, when you get to Amos chapter 7, verse 12, Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy. So he's saying, we don't want your message here because you're bringing discouragement. Again, fast forward, and I like to take the Bible because I think it's practical through every generation. There are insights we can gain from what God says. And uh, even to those in the past, we should be learning from those things ourselves here in the present. And once again, 
it is not really a popular thing to give the full counsel of God. It really isn't. There are, there are ministries today that are being built on making sure not to bring a word that discourages because people get upset. I was just told that this just this last week that there's somebody who doesn't want to come here because they feel convicted. They don't want to be convicted. They want to go someplace where they don't have a sense of conviction. And that's not an atypical thing. There are quite a number of people who say, you know, speak to me smooth things. Speak to me things I want to hear. Tickle my ears. Don't make me feel that there's anything wrong in my life. And that's what was taking place here. That's what was taking place during that time. And so Amaziah says to, to Amos, don't be speaking like that here. Go to Judah. Go down south and, and speak to them and eat there and, and live there, but leave us alone. So when he tells them, go, you see, or flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread and there prophesy, Amos responded by prophesying against Israel. And he gave a personal word against Amaziah. In chapter 7, verses 14 and 15, Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a herdsman and a tender of sycamore fruit, then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. And now he begins to prophesy, and he gives a word to Amaziah, and he says in chapter 7, verse 17, this is to this, this priest Amaziah, Your wife, he says to Amaziah, Your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by survey line. You shall die in a defiled land. And Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. And so when he's saying prophesy to us smooth things, don't be saying things to discourage us. Go down to Judah and say that to them, but leave us alone. He got very intensely personal at that moment. Well, that message, that message that he has that we'll be looking at as we go through Amos was not well received because the nation at that time was doing outwardly well. There was a false sense of security that had taken over, and people began to be calloused concerning God, his law, and the things that he would require of man. And so because of this, Amos prophesied that God would bring judgment. And the judgment he speaks about is both near and future, and we'll see that as we go through the book. You see, the nation of Israel is filled with outward religion, but it's also filled with oppression of the poor, with idolatry and self-righteousness. The nation is filled with greed and materialism. It's filled with arrogance and, 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 and is now ripe for judgment. So Amos begins to warn them, but they refuse to repent, and judgment is going to come upon them. We will see that as we go through the book of Amos. And so beginning in verses 1 and 2 here in Amos chapter 1, the words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. He said, the Lord roars from Zion, utters his voice from Jerusalem, the pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. Eloquent words for a man who is really what we would today refer to as a country preacher. He speaks uh, of two years, uh, two years, he says, before the earthquake. Now that's speaking of a great earthquake that occurred in the nation of Israel, and, and that is spoken of almost 200 years later in the book of Zechariah, because in Zechariah 14, verse 5, it says, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. So he's using that as a, as a marker for time to let the people know when he is prophesying and all. And he says in verse 2, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. And so God is portrayed here. Notice how it says in verse 2, the Lord roars. God is portrayed as a lion. Well, when it says the Lord roars from Zion, utters his voice from Jerusalem, he's portrayed as a lion that's about to pounce upon its prey. God is being presented here in the book of Amos from the beginning 
as about to bring judgment. And he uses this description to awaken them. Joel, in chapter 3, verse 16, says it like this. The Lord also will roar from Zion, utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So God is portrayed as a lion about to pounce upon a prey because he's bringing judgment. And so it says, the Lord roars from Zion, utters his voice from Jerusalem, then goes on to say, the pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel, Mount Carmel, withers. So what is he saying? He's saying there's going to be a drought. And this drought is going to cause people to mourn because the judgments are going to be coming across from God. And the drought is going to produce a famine. And the people are going to be hungering. And there'll be a time of great sorrow and great pain. Now, as he's bringing this theme of judgment, he begins to itemize different places that will go through judgment. And as I said, I'll touch on these things briefly. This isn't going to be a real long Bible study today, I don't think. We'll see. I'll wake you up when I'm through. In verse 3, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron. But I will send a fire into the house of Hazael, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. I will also break the gate bar of Damascus, cut off the inhabitant from the valley of Aven, and the one who holds the scepter from Beth Eden. The people of Syria shall go captive to Ker, says the Lord. Now he's beginning to bring judgment place by place. So this is a section that deals with the judgments upon nations that are close to the nation of Israel. Now, we need to remember that God is not simply the God of Israel, but God is the God of the entire world. And though we're living in his time of grace, he still is going to judge the world for its rejection of him. And the Bible makes it very clear that God is judge. When you look at Psalm 50, verse 6, it says, Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. During this time, there was this belief amongst the, the pagan nations that you had what would be called your local deities, your local god. And so the Ammonites would have their god. But you'd have the gods of the Moabites. And you'd have a variety of peoples that are around Israel that had what are called tribal gods. And so if I were part of a nation that was at war with another nation, I might bring an idol with me, which was symbolic of the fact that this God that I worshiped was on my side in battle. But if the people that we are fighting against were to have victory over us, then it would not simply be a picture of these people having victory. It would be a picture of their God also having victory. And so during the time of the writing of the Bible, these people would carry with them their tribal gods. But the Bible does not portray God as a tribal God. The Bible portrays God, reveals God to be the God of the whole earth. Abraham is speaking to uh, visitors, heavenly visitors, when he's there outside of a tent. And beginning, the, beginning to speak to him, God himself is beginning to speak to Abram concerning judgment that is going to take place on Sodom and Gomorrah and some of the small cities that surrounded those, those two cities and all. And, and as Abraham is speaking to the Lord, it's in chapter 18 of Genesis, when he's speaking to the Lord, he says, shall not the judge of the whole earth do what is right. So Abram, from that point, he knew that this God that he's speaking to is not a tribal God, but God is the God of the entire earth. And that's why the heavens declare his righteousness, because God is a judge. And so he's bringing judgment, and that's the point that he's making. And he's speaking concerning various places that judgment will take place on. First is Damascus. And as we look at that, he begins to speak concerning that. Damascus, Sirius. God is judging them. 
God is judging them because of their cruelty. And he's judging them because of their cruelty to the inhabitants of Gilead. When you look in a map, and you look on the east side of, of the, the, the Jordan River, that area there, south a little north of and to the, to the uh, east of Jerusalem, we'll say, that region in that general area is called Gilead. And so he's speaking concerning the cruelty to the inhabitants of Gilead. Now, it would seem that they've committed atrocities. Notice what it says. For three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron. The implements of iron were instruments that were used for reaping. And the picture that you have here is unspeakable cruelty that they were using on those that they were coming against. These, these people from Damascus were actually butchering the people that they were coming against. That's what he's saying. They have threshed Gilead with implements of iron, which you say how cruel the people of that day were, and we have that taking place even today through ISIS. And that's what was taking place even then. There were atrocities. They were using threshing instruments in a brutal fashion. And so as you're looking at the map and you're looking at Jerusalem and you're going north a bit, a little bit, you're looking into an area there, Gilead, that would be called today the Golan Heights. And he says these atrocities took place. So what is he going to do? Verse 4, he says, I'll send fire into the house of Hazael, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. And so when he speaks of Hazael, he's speaking of a king. The palaces of Ben-Hadad speaks of ancestral palaces in Syria. And what he's saying simply is, I'm going to bring judgment on the king of Syria. He says in verse 5, I... I will also break the gate bar of Damascus, Damascus city, Syria, cut off the inhabitants of the valley of Aven, and the one who holds the scepter from Beth Eden, the people of Syria, shall go captive and curse as the Lord. And so these are locations that speak of areas that are in Syria, and he's saying that this is going to take place. These people that he's referring to were taken captive by the Assyrians, and they were relocated to a place near the Assyrian capital. He goes on to speak of judgment on Gaza, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four. Now when he uses that formula, he's speaking about a multiple transgressions. It's not just that they had four, but this is a way of saying you have many transgressions. I will not turn away its punishment. And he gives a reason, because they took captive the whole captivity to deliver them to Edom. But I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, which shall devour its palaces. I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. And so he continues and he's saying this is another location and this is for Gaza. Gaza is um, in the south. If you're looking at Israel, Gaza is to the south and to the west of the city of Jerusalem. And it's the region that the Philistines occupied during that day. It's speaking of the Philistine Empire. And he's saying, I'm bringing judgment on you because what you have done is, and he says it in verse 6, you have taken captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. You have taken prisoners of war and you have sold them into slavery. And so I'm going to deal with you. Now this is something that did take place because in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 7 and 8, it speaks concerning Hezekiah, a king, and it says the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria, did not serve him. He subdued the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. So God says, I'm bringing judgment, which took place through Hezekiah. Verses 9 and 10, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, did not remember the covenant of brotherhood, but I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre which shall devour its palaces. Tyre is also ancient Phoenicia. 
It's up to the north in what is modern Lebanon. And it's interesting what they're getting judged for. They're getting judged, he says, for breaking a treaty. For breaking a treaty. They did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. It's another way of saying they broke a treaty. We'll take a moment to look at that. What is he referring to? Now, if you read your Bible, you're going to discover that there's a king by the name of David. King David had a buddy, a friend, by the name of Hiram. Hiram was king of Tyre. King Hiram was close to King David. And so they had a covenant that they had made. You see, no king of Israel, no king of Judah had ever made war with Tyre because they had a covenant. But this covenant, this treaty had been broken. And as they broke the treaty with Israel, they had sold the Jews into captivity to the Edomites. We'll look at that in a moment because all of this is going to tie together and you'll see this in just a minute as they develop some practical application for this. But they sold the Jews into captivity to the Edomites and they disregarded their covenant with the nation of Israel. Now I mentioned that David made a, a treaty with this man named Hiram and this treaty had been renewed by his son Solomon. In 1 Kings 5 verse 12 it says, The Lord gave Solomon wisdom just as he had promised him there were peaceful relations between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. But the treaty had been broken, and God brings judgment on them. In verse 10 it says, I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre, which shall devour its palaces. Eventually the Assyrians came against Tyre, but they couldn't take the city. Eventually a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came against them. And they built a city on an island about a half mile off the coast. Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed the city, the former city, but he allowed the one that was built a half mile into the sea, he allowed that uh, to remain. Around 250 years later, a man by the name of Alexander the Great came. And these people on the city that were there on the island um, began to taunt him. And so what Alexander did, he was an amazing general, what Alexander did is he built what is called a causeway. He just got debris from the old city and they built a roadway into the ocean from the debris of the old city. And they came and they took the city of Tyre. Ezekiel tells us in chapter 26, verses 2 through 4, it reads, Son of man, because Tyre has said against Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken, who was the gateway of the peoples. Now she is turned over to me. I shall be filled. She is laid waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against you as the sea causes its waves to come up. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre, break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her look and make her like the top of a rock, which is exactly what took place. The city was destroyed. In verse 11 and 12, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Because he pursued his brother with the sword, cast off all pity, his anger tore perpetually. He kept his wrath forever. I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. Now we'll look at that. Judgment against Edom. Why was judgment being brought against Edom? Edom had a vengeful spirit. Now when you're looking at a map, and you're looking at Israel, across to the east, Jordan River, you find the land of Edom. Edom descended from a man by the name of Esau, even as Israel descended from a man named Jacob. When you read the Bible in the book of Genesis, you discover that Jacob and Esau were twin brothers, twin brothers to their father Isaac. And from the very beginning, they had conflict, even in the womb. There were two nations within the womb that were battling against one another. And so, 
from the very beginning, there was antagonism between the two men. As you read the Bible, Esau never had a good relationship with his brother Jacob, and he never lives at peace with him. So his descendants also opposed the Jews. When Israel was delivered from Egypt and was in the wilderness, they needed to pass through the region of Edom. And it says in the book of Numbers 20, verses 17 through 20, that they made a request. They said, please let us pass through your country. We will not pass through fields or vineyards, nor will we drink water from wells. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we pass through your territory. Edom said to him, you shall not pass through my land lest I come out against you with a sword. So the children of Israel said to him, we will go by the highway and if I or my livestock drink any of your water, then I'll pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. He said, you shall not pass through. So Edom came out against them with many men and with a strong hand. And God says, because of that, I will bring judgment upon you. Notice what he says in verse 12, I will send a fire upon Teman. Teman is a region that is there in what is today modern Jordan, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. And uh, Basra is a town there in that area. Now I'm gonna send a fire upon Teman. All of you have heard the, the city of Petra. Petra is the capital of Edom. Petra was located in the region of Teman. And so he's simply saying the palaces of the city of Basra will be destroyed, and they were. In Jeremiah 49, 13, I have sworn by myself, says the Lord, that Basra shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse, and all its cities shall be perpetual wastes. And then he says in verse 13, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the people of Ammon and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they ripped open the women with child in Gilead that they might enlarge their territory. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah and it shall devour its palaces amid shouting in the day of battle and a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. Their king shall go into captivity. He and his princes together, says the Lord. Ammon. Ammon is north of Edom, again in the region of modern Jordan, and was a, an ally of Syria. Ammonites. Ammonites are descendants that came into existence through a, an incestuous relationship between Abraham's nephew, Lot, and his youngest daughter. When you look in the story of Abraham, Abraham was an idolater in the land of Ur of the Chaldees in ancient Mesopotamia. And the Lord God spoke to Abraham and said, get out of your country, I'm going to take you to a place that I'm going to bless you with. Now he was from a family of idolaters, but God revealed himself to Abram. At that time his name was Abram. Abram had a wife. Her name was Sarai. The name Abram, when you look at it, is uh, literally translated high, fault, high father, exalted, high father. Sarai is the name dominative. And so God speaks to Abram, says, get up, leave your, leave your, uh, your family and everything you know, and follow me by faith into a region and in a place that I'm only promising you, and that you by the eye of faith are going to have to see and receive. And I'm going to take you, and I'm going to bless you. And ultimately, you see this in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. He says, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And you see the Lord beginning to minister in very specific ways from Genesis 12 following in the life of Abram. Abram ultimately has an opportunity, an opportunity to, um, to choose where he's going to be, because you see, he has a nephew by the name of Lot. And Lot and Abram both had been, become very wealthy through the um, fact that they had herds that were multiplying. And the uh, herdsmen 
for Abram and the herdsmen for Lot began to have conflict because the herds had grown so great in numbers and all that it is causing a problem between uh, those two groups. And so Abram speaks to his nephew. And they're standing there at the plain of Sodom. Now when you read your Bible, Sodom is described as being an amazingly beautiful place. If you've been to Israel, you know that when you go into the region of Sodom, which is by the Dead Sea now, that it is absolutely barren. It's dead. Everything's dead around there. It's very uninhabitable. But that's how it became. That's not how it was. So during the time of Abram and his, his nephew Lot, when they were standing there looking at this plain, Abram said, you decide what you'd like to do. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. And so the Bible tells us very descriptively that when Lot is looking, he sees how beautiful and lush Sodom is in the surrounding area, and he chooses to go into Sodom. So first he looks at Sodom and chooses to go there. Ultimately, he dwells in Sodom and finally becomes a judge within the gates of Sodom. So he became very situated in this very evil region, very evil city. As he's there, and as he's amongst these people, God makes a visitation to Abram, his uncle, and says, the cry of the evil and wickedness of this area has come to my ears. I have come down to see whether these things are so. In other words, I'm investigating for judgment. And at that point, we all know the story, because Abram knows that he has his nephew, his nephew's wife, and a certain amount of family that is there. Abram begins at that point to begin to, to, to discuss God's mercy with him and says, for the sake of 50, will you spare the city? And God says, yes, for the sake of 50. And he keeps on bargaining, if you will, speaking to the Lord. How about 40? How about 30? How about 20? Because he wants to come to the number 10. He wants to come to the number 10 because that's how many relatives he has there in the city of Sodom. So he finally comes to the number 10. For the sake of 10, I've taken it upon myself to speak to you. I'll speak to you one more time, then I'll be silent. For the sake of 10, will you spare that city? And God says, yes, I will spare that city for the sake of 10. And now he knows that there can be mercy afforded to Lot, his wife and daughters and sons-in-law and all of that. He knows that that can take place and he rests in the, in the goodness and mercy of God as God goes and pays that visit. We all know the story of what took place when the angels came in. And as they came into the city, the city of Sodom, they knocked on the door of Lot, and Lot opens the door and brings them in. Actually, you can almost see him dragging them in as quickly as possible because the men of the city were exceedingly wicked. And he wanted to protect them. And he says, come on in, come under the shelter of my roof. But the men of Sodom pressed against the door and started saying, bring out the men that are lodging with you because we want to know them. We want to have carnal relations with them. And he came out and argued with them. And he said, no, these men are visitors. They're under the customary protection of my home. How can you do such an evil thing? And he even went so far as to say, I've got two virgin daughters. Take them. They said, no, you came to sojourn amongst us and now you've become our judge. And the angels caused blindness to take place in those and they, who were trying to press into the house and they were groping as if in the dark. They were blind and they couldn't, they couldn't find them. And, 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 and Lot is, is commanded, get out, leave nothing behind, move. Well, he had compromised his testimony with his family and when he says, we've got to get out of here, there's going to be a judgment that's taking place. Not everyone went with him. His wife did and two of his daughters. And as they went out, we all know the story of Lot's wife. As they were leaving the city and fleeing as quickly as they could to a small city called Zoar, as they were on the way there, she turned around and she looked. And everybody knows the story of Lot's wife. As a matter of fact, Jesus uses it in his teaching prophetically by simply saying, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. She turned and she looked. And I used to wonder, why did she get judged for doing something like that? 
Because the Bible says that when she turned and looked, she became a pillar of salt. She was caught in the judgment that came upon those cities. It's because when you look at what it's saying there, it is literally saying that Lot's wife turned with longing because though her body had left Sodom, her heart remained. And so she was caught in the judgment and she became a pillar of salt. The two daughters are there with their father. And they speak to one another and they say, our father is not going to have any seed to carry on his name. And this is what we'll do. The older and the younger devised a plan. And they gave drink to their father Lot. And when he was drunk, totally incapacitated apparently, they went and lay with him. And he impregnated both of his daughters. One of his daughters became the one who bore the nation of Moab. The other daughter, the younger one, is the one who brought forth the Ammonites. And so the Ammonites are being referred to here in this particular portion of Scripture. They were descended from the incestuous relationship of Lot and his youngest daughter. The Moabites and the Ammonites came into existence through them. You know, by way of application, It began with a look with Lot. It began with a look. Abram said, you look, which side do you want? Rather than humbly saying, Abram, I owe everything to you. Everything to you. You see, when you read the story of Lot, Lot had been taken captive by, by the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. He'd been taken captive when they had come and done a raid. And, and Abram armed men of his own household, and they went off and rescued Lot from captivity. And he had seen nothing but good from his uncle Abram. But when he was looking and he saw how beautiful Sodom was, how lush and beautiful and how great it would be to live in that upper echelon, that upper neighborhood, if you will, his eyes just desired those things. His heart was captivated by those things, and ultimately he was dwelling amongst those things and began, even though the scripture says that he was vexed by the, by the sinful ways that they lived, he remained there. Be very careful what you set your affection on. Be very careful what you set your attention on. Be very careful what you long for, because you just may get it. It's interesting how the scripture says that, that God gave to the children of Israel their requests, but he sent leanness to their souls. And there are some things that we might long for and desire to have, things that we think we can't live without that are actually going to be destructive in our spiritual life or in our, our marriage or in our jobs or whatever because we're setting our attention and affection on things that are not edifying. He began in a good way, but he ended up having an incestuous relationship with his two daughters and producing Moabites and Ammonites. Ammonites. Now, as it speaks here, it says in verse 13, for three transgressions of the people of Ammon and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they ripped open the women with child in Gilead that they might enlarge their territory. What they had done, these people, is they had joined the Syrians and they began to fight against the tribes of Israel that had remained on the eastern side. The Lord had said to the children of Israel to cross over the Jordan and enter in and take the land of Israel. But there were two and a half tribes that remained. There was the tribe of Reuben, which is the first Mexican tribe. There was Gad. And then you had half the half tribe of Manasseh. And they remained on the east side of the Jordan. And so these were people that had been attacked by the Ammonites who had joined forces with the Syrians. And when it speaks concerning this horrible thing, and notice that they ripped open the women with child, that is, there's, there's hardly anything more descriptive of something more barbaric than the fact that these were pregnant women 
that these, these soldiers took their knives or swords and sliced them open, killing the women and killing those children. Well, that occurred under Hazael. In 2 Kings chapter 8, verses 7 through 12, it speaks of Elisha the prophet, and it says, Elisha went to Damascus. Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, was sick. It was told him, saying, The man of God has come here. And the king said to Hazael, Take a present in your hand, and go meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? So Hazael went to meet him and took a present with him of every good thing of Damascus, 40 camel loads. And he came and stood before him and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? And Elisha said to him, Go say to him, You shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. Then he set his countenance in a stare until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. Hazael said, why is my Lord weeping? He answered, because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire. Their young men you will kill with the sword. And you will dash their children and rip open their women with child. When this man went back to Ben-Hadad to bring this, uh, this news, he ended up murdering the king and took over himself. And so Elisha was simply prophesying what was going to take place. And for that, God judged the Ammonites. He said in verse uh, 14, I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah and shall devour its palaces amid shouting in the day of battle and a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. Their king shall go into captivity. He and his princes together, says the Lord. And so he said, I'll, I'll kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah. Rabbah is an ancient city. It's the ancient capital of Ammon. Ammon is located nearby and built upon its ancient ruins. And this city was destroyed. Jeremiah 49 says at verse 2, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I'll cause to be heard an alarm of war in Rabbah of the Ammonites. It shall be desolate mound, a desolate mound. Her villages shall be burned with fire. Then Israel shall take possession of his inheritance, says the Lord. And then finally, the king shall go into captivity, he and the princes together. It's interesting, and I'll close with a couple of thoughts, when it says their king shall go into captivity. That word king there is interesting because it is also translated moloch. King, king, the king referred to there, it could be translated moloch. Moloch, I mentioned to you, it's also moloch, was a a god, a pagan god, that, I, I shared this with you recently, was, was worshipped where they would actually, um, it had a, a human, human body, and I believe it had a, a um, it had a, a, I can't remember the, the kind of head it had, but it was ugly, but it, it and an animal's head, and they had the arms in a certain way, and it actually had seven chambers. And you would, make, you would make sacrifices for a variety of things, and you would put whatever your sacrifice, whether it was grain or whatever, you would put it on into a, a little, uh, they called it chapels, in a little chapel, and it would burn. But if you wanted fertility, if you wanted to have many children, what you would do is you would come with your infant, your firstborn, and you would place it in the arms of this, it was a, it was a bull. You would put, your, put the baby in the arms of the bull, God, and the baby would roll down the arm into a furnace. During that act of worship and sacrifice, music would be played very loudly and it would be what is called discordant. It would be music that just made no sense. It just was loud and confusing because they wanted the father who was making the sacrifice to not be able to hear the sound of his child who was being burned alive in the belly of this idol. So, 
when it says their king shall go into captivity, he and his princes together, the king is also translated Moloch, the idol of the Ammonites. So it can speak of Moloch as well as the king itself. The princes can also be speaking not simply of governmental officials, but also those who are religious priests, if you will, leaders. And so it may be that when he's writing, he's speaking of, of not just the king in terms of politics, but the entire system is to go into captivity. Everything is to be undermined and destroyed because God is going to conquer all of that. The king shall go into captivity. He and his princes together could be another way of saying the God of Israel will be victorious, not just against the human government, but the religious system behind it. One of the things, and we'll close with this thought, that we need to keep in mind, especially today, is that governmental systems throughout the world, though they may be denying their ori original um, foundation, many of them are ideological governmental systems that are based on a certain religious principle and faith. The United States was initially built on what has been referred to as the Judeo-Christian ethic because pilgrims came and brought their God, brought the Bible, brought their faith. And pilgrims derived their faith not simply from what is called the Christian faith, but from its Jewish roots, and that's why it's called Judeo-Christian, Jewish Christian. I have uh, right now, you can't see it obviously because I have it under my t-shirt, but I have a uh, Star David and a cross and that I wear. And I was in line at a, at a local market a while back now, and the guy behind the counter who was doing the uh, checking and all saw it. And he was kind of uh, interesting because he reached over and he, and he grabbed it, actually flicked it. He kind of picked it up like that and said, what's this? And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, that's kind of a rude thing to do. You, I'm, not used to, I'm not used to people <laughs> taking and doing that. You know, that's kind of a rude thing to do. And so I said, what do you mean? He said, well, what is that? And I said, it's a uh, Star of David with a cross. And he says to me, and what's it mean? I said, it, it means I'm going to hit you in the nose. I, no, I, I said, <laughs> I'm not going to pay for this bread. No, what does it mean? What does it mean? And I said, it's giving uh, recognition to my Christian faith that the Star of David represents the nation of Israel. The cross represents Christ who is Jewish. And so the Star of David with the cross is symbolic of my faith in Christ who's Jewish. And so it turns out that the guy was a professing Christian, so he asks me, what church do you go to? And I said, uh, I go to Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Oh, and then he tells me, I came out of a Calvary Chapel. He mentions the name of the Calvary that he came out of. And now he wants to argue with me about the pastor of that church. And this, I just want my bread. <laughs> my, my milk, you know, let me out of here. What are you going to argue? First you're picking a fight, now you want to talk about my friends. It was odd. It was odd. But the whole thing is, as a Christian, I look back at the roots that I have. And I know that my belief system is built in the Judeo-Christian faith. And I also know that this government that we have is also built on that. It's interesting when people begin to say, you cannot legislate morality. You've all heard it. But the fact is, that's what laws do. Every law that we have, almost every law that you have, is going to find itself rooted in one of the commandments of God. 
And that's one of the reasons why it's so very important for us to understand that when it comes to argumentation as it relates to the changing of laws to include different forms of making determinations as to what is right and wrong, which is the argument that people are having right now concerning the implementation of what is called Sharia law. Because that comes into conflict with the American understanding of, of law and order. And Americans right now don't seem to understand that whenever somebody who is, who is Muslim, who is very strongly Muslim, whenever they say, I don't like you saying Jesus, or whenever they say, I don't like you doing whatever in the name of saying Merry Christmas or whatever, we don't like that, what they're in reality doing, and a lot of people don't understand this, is they're basically saying, I don't like your religion, so I'm going to have mine over yours. So every time we turn out and we say, oh, you know, we're being Christian and all of that, sure, okay, I won't mention Jesus because it offends you. In reality, I have just put myself voluntarily under their law, which if you're in Saudi Arabia or any other government that is under Sharia, if you're in that country, you can't wear a cross, you can't bring your Bible in, you don't mention the name of Jesus, you won't find a church unless it's underground. And that's what's taking place right now. There is a battle going on. It's spiritual in nature. It is spiritual in nature. It is a battle of God's truth and Satan's lie. And as Christians, we understand that. We also know the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. We understand it that our weaponry is spiritual, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. Our, our loins are girded with truth. We have our feet shod in the preparation of the gospel of peace. We walk in the power of the Holy Spirit because we understand that it's not simply someone's opinion, especially when they're trying to forbid the name of Jesus from being said, but it is spiritual in nature because Satan hates Jesus Christ. That's the reason why we understand that our God is not simply a God of compassion. Our God is an awesome judge of the universe, and that's why we bow our knees to Jesus Christ alone. That's why, because we understand that. And God is simply saying, those false gods that you have been worshiping, I am the God over everything, everything. And that's where the New Testament comes in, where the Bible says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So what you're looking at, amen. So he's saying, I am victorious, not just over government, but be, I am victorious over the ideologies that create false religions that destroy lives. I am the God that will destroy those too. They will be under my feet. All of that is fulfilled through Jesus Christ.